Hello, everyone. I'm today's moderator, Sayaka Dake, from the Graduate School of Law of Tokyo University. Today, we'll have an online dialogue entitled The Role of International Collaboration and Culture Regarding the COVID-19 Pandemic. This online dialogue, hosted by Toho Forum for Creativity of Tokyo University, invites three professors of Tokyo University who are all leading experts in each field of research. Before we start the dialogue, President of Tohoku University, Hideo Ono, will give you a message on behalf of Tohoku University. Hi, uh, I'm Hideo Ono, President of Tohoku University. I would like to welcome you all to this special event uh, hosted by Tohoku Forum for Creativity. Uh, let me say a few words uh, starting well, before the, the dialogue starting by giving you a very, very brief history of Tohoku University. Tohoku University was established 113 years ago with funds from the government, the prefecture, and private donations. So in this sense, Tohoku University has been a socially supported university since its inception and has always placed a high priority on social contribution. At the time of the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011, more than 100 projects were voluntarily launched by members of the university, and the university itself also launched eight major projects to tackle disaster recovery and related social issues. Well, in 2015, uh, we expanded the horizon, uh, and, and in this 2015, 15. Uh, this was the year when the three United Nations agendas, uh, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Reduction, the SDGs, and the Paris Agreement for Climate Change were established. In this very year of 2015, uh, Tohoku University has also launched 30 projects under the title of Research with an Impact on Society. Well, this actually includes a project of infectious disease led by today's uh, speaker, uh, Hitoshi Oshitani. Well, backed by such a history, Tohoku University has been responding to COVID-19 in a wide range of ways. More than 200 research proposals on COVID-19 were received in the recent survey. That includes medicine, testing, public health, and various technologies that support them, and so on and so forth. Well, today's event approaches COVID-19 from somewhat different angle, as we will hear from experts in epidemiology, international law, and the history of religion. We hope to provide you a broader view of the current COVID-19 situation to deepen our understanding and thoughts. The first speaker, Hitoshi Oshitani, was stationed in the Philippines as a WHO member and dealt with the SARS outbreak at the time. He has been and currently is a member of the team of experts leading our country's COVID-19 response. Toshio Ueki is an expert in international law, and we all know international collaboration as well as international consolidated response are critical in suppressing the spread of COVID-19. Toshiaki Kimura, is a leading member of the university's nearly 100-year-old religious studies lineage uh, who can address how the society have viewed and embraced epidemics in the past, especially in Japan. Well, our society has to deal with uh, COVID-19 for some time. As such, we hope this event provides you on the, uh, one of the opportunities uh, to deepen our thinking about relationship between society and infectious diseases. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, back to Dake-sensei. Thank you very much, President Ono. Uh, President Ono has already introduced and I will also introduce uh, today's three speakers. First, I'd like to introduce yes. Professor Hitoshi Oshitani from the Graduate School of Medicine. Professor Oshitani, could you tell us uh, your specific field of research? 
In my department, we are mainly doing the research on infectious diseases, particularly the viral infections, such as influenza, norovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, and others. And uh, we are mainly doing the field research in different countries, including the Philippines, Cambodia, and Zambia. Thank you very much. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce Executive Vice President of Tohoku University, Toshia Ueki. Professor Ueki, could you tell us your uh, specific field of research or what kind of research you are doing? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adake. Uh, I have been Professor of International Law of Tohoku University since 1999. And my research field is uh, international law in general, but especially the law of international organizations, in, including the United Nations system of specialized agencies and regional organizations. So I'd like to focus on the WHO reaction on, to COVID-19 and so on. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Ueki. Finally, I'd like to introduce Professor Toshiaki Kimura from the Graduate School of Arts and Letters. So, Professor Kimura, could you tell us your specific field of research? Um, my specialty is uh, religious studies, uh, and I've been working mainly in Japan and Indonesia, uh, focusing on the problem of the disaster and religion. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you very much, Professor Kimura. Now, I'd like to start an online dialogue with these three professors. So we will address the first topic, which is the current understanding towards infectious disease and their history and issues moving forward. So I like hand over to Professor Oshitani to analyze the current global and Japanese situation of COVID-19 and Japan's or East Asia strategy against COVID-19. So please. Thank you very much, Professor Dake. Uh, I would like to talk mainly the, the COVID-19, but uh, also the brief the historical background of uh, emerging diseases or emerging infectious diseases. The next slide, please. The emerging infection is uh, the new, newly emerged infection in, uh, the, for the first time in a human or the rapidly increasing the, in the human population. Actually, next slide, please. The emerging in diseases are not new. The, for example, smallpox the, had been causing the major problem in, for the human population for the, over 10,000 years until the, it was eradicated in the 1980. And also the plague in the European countries in the 40th century is very famous. And also in, in Japan, the, we've been suffering from uh, the, the infectious diseases for the, the thousands of years. The, especially the, after the Japan was open to other countries, the, the, we have been the, the suffering from uh, the major infectious disease outbreaks like uh, the smallpox outbreak or the cholera outbreak. The, 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 the picture the, in the center the, is uh, the famous uh, the big Buddha statue in Nara that crossed the Kyoto. The, which was uh, the created in the uh, 88th century the, after the major outbreak of uh, the smallpox in the Nara. And also the, in Edo period in Japan, the, the border were the virtually closed. But the, when we opened the border in uh, the Meiji period, the, the number of uh, the major outbreaks was increased, the, including the cholera, uh, major cholera outbreaks, as shown in uh, the, the figure on the right. The next slide, please. And the globalization is the, the belief to the, be increasing the risk of uh, the emerging infectious diseases the, the because the risk of emergence of the new disease is increasing, the, mainly because of uh, the rapidly increasing the human population and also the risk of uh, the rapid spread of the newly emerged disease uh, is the significantly increasing the, because of uh, the globalization. The next slide, please. The, the COVID-19 was uh, the first notified to WHO the, from the Chinese government on the 31st of December last year. But uh, the virus has probably emerged the, before the, the December last year. And by January 23rd, 
the virus has already spread to many cities in China and also some other countries, including Japan, Korea, and Thailand. And uh, in, on January 23rd, the Wuhan city was uh, the lockdown. And uh, next slide, please. The, by March 11, the virus spread to many countries. And actually, the, the, the focus of outbreak has shifted to the European countries. And on that day, on March 11, the, which is uh, the greatest uh, Japan earthquake anniversary, the WHO declared, or WHO mentioned that the, the, this outbreak is considered to be a pandemic the, on that particular day. And the next, please. The, this is the current situation the, as of yesterday. And uh, there are more than 11 million cases, the, the, nearly the 12 million cases worldwide, the, with more than the, the half million deaths the, worldwide. And uh, the different part of the world, the, including the, the South America, the Africa, and the, some other places. The next slide, please. The epidemiological, the, this COVID-19 was the, the caused by the new, newly found the virus, the called the SARS-CoV-2, and which is uh, the, the biologically the closely the related to the the, the SARS coronavirus, the, which is uh, the causative agent for the SARS in 2003. But the epidemiologically and the clinically, the, the virus is quite different. And the major difference is the severity of the disease. The, for SARS, the most of the infected individuals develop very severe the symptoms. But the, for COVID-19, there are many milder cases and even asymptomatic cases. The, which means that the, the cases infected individuals who do not develop any symptoms. That this makes the, the COVID-19 very difficult to control. And the next slide, please. And uh, actually, the, from the, the early stage of outbreak, the Japanese researchers the, the found the peculiar the characteristic of this virus. And this virus, uh, for this virus, the majority of infected people, the nearly 80% of infected people, they do not infect others. But the small portion of uh, infected individuals infect many others. And uh, so we believe that uh, without cluster or the super spreading event, uh, which means that one person infect many others, the, the, the virus transmission chain they cannot be sustained. So our approach is the focus, focusing on the, the cluster. And um, the preventing cluster, especially in early the phase of outbreak, can result in a suppression of the virus. And the next slide, please. But um, the, we need to find the, the cluster. And uh, in many other countries, in most of countries, the, they are only doing so-called the, the prospective contact tracing. This is a usual contact tracing. The, when you find the, the cases, you identify the contact the, among the cases and follow up uh, the, the, these contacts. But uh, in addition to the prospective contact tracing, we are also the, doing the retrospective contact tracing, the, which means that uh, the, the we are the going back to, the, to identify the, the common source of infection. That because uh, the without cluster or the super spreading event, the, the transmission chain cannot be sustained. So we try to identify the common source, which is the most likely to be a cluster. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, by analyzing the many clusters, the, we found that uh, there are some common characteristics the, for most of clusters, and uh, which is the crowded spaces and the crowded, uh, the closed the spaces, especially in the indoor the environment, and the close contact setting, the, 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 when uh, the people are the talking in the close the, the contact setting. And uh, the further analysis of uh, the, the many other clusters, they also identify the additional risk factors, such as uh, exercise, 
talking in a loud voice, then the singing, and the nightlife setting. And uh, right now, we are uh, seeing the many night nightlife setting associated cases in Tokyo. And the uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is the summary of outbreak of COVID-19 in Japan. The, the, the very first case was identified on the, the January 15th. And the number of cases increased the, from uh, the, uh, the end of the, the March. And uh, we declared the state of emergency on the 4th of April. And, uh, but the number of cases decreased the, from early April. And the state of emergency was lifted on the 25th of May. But uh, now the number of cases is slightly increasing. And uh, we are trying to the, the suppress the transmission in Tokyo and other places. Next slide, please. So the action taken by WHO COVID-19, the, the, the public health emergency of international concern was declared on January 13th. The, in the statement of the, the, this, the, the public health emergency of international concern, the WHO said that, uh, that this virus is still possible to interrupt the, the spread, but the, which was the, apparently not possible. And uh, the, also, the travel recommendation is an important function of the WHO, but the WHO still do not, does not uh, the, the recommend the, any travel restriction. The, although many countries, most of the countries in the world, are uh, imposing some the very strict the travel restriction. And uh, also, the, in terms of infection prevention and control, WHO is still the, does not uh, the, the include uh, the, the usual uh, WHO also still the mentioning that the usual droplet and the contact are the major mode of transmission. And uh, this is uh, the major discussion in the past few days. And uh, aerosol transmission that might, might, they should be occurring for this virus. And uh, next slide, please. The, the action taken for w, by WHO SARS in 2003, at that time I was working in the WHO, was quite, were quite different. And uh, WHO issued the global alert on March the 12th of 2003. And uh, so in that statement, the WHO was very cautious uh, in assessment of the situation. And uh, also on April 2nd, on the of the 20, 2003, WHO issued the, the very strict travel restriction uh, to postpone the non-essential travel to the certain places, the, which is not issued in for the, the, uh, the COVID-19. And uh, also, the various professional group networks were created, including the clinical network, laboratory network, and other networks. And every day, the, we were having a, the, the uh, teleconference. We didn't have a Zoom or some other the, the method, but uh, the, that such network was very active the, the, during the SARS in 2003. And the next slide, please. And um, this slide shows uh, the difference between the, the countries the, in terms of the number of deaths and the number of deaths per uh, 100,000. As shown in the figure, the, the Asian countries, particularly East Asian countries, uh, generally spared the, from the impact of the, the, the COVID-19. The, but uh, the, most of European countries and the US and the, some other countries the, are having uh, the very the severe outbreaks. The next slide, please. The, there are probably the many reasons the, for the, such differences. But uh, the European countries and the U.S. and some other countries are uh, using a quite different approach from the, our approach in Asia. And uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID is often the, the discussed the, with uh, the war metaphor in uh, the European countries and the U.S. And, uh, and uh, the, in the U.S., they tried to the contain completely the, the virus, that which was the apparently not possible. And I attended the, the, the webinar the last week the, for the, the, the China, uh, Korea, and the Japan. 
And uh, these three countries are using the quite a different approaches. But uh, we managed to the, suppress the transmission in these three countries, the, which is uh, quite the, the different the, from uh, the European and uh, the North American countries. And uh, we need to find out why there are the, such a difference between uh, the region. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Oshitani, for your very clear presentation. So, Professor Ueki, would you give us your comments or questions uh, on, about uh, Professor Oshitani's presentation? Yes, thank you very much indeed, Professor Oshitani. I could have wrote uh, very concisely and very precisely for the COVID-19 situations. Uh, I have one question to Professor Oshitani. Uh, Professor Oshitani mentioned uh, that uh, you, you, you served as a uh, WHO expert during the SARS uh, outbreak in 2003. And of course, the uh, virus in SARS and uh, COVID-19 is a very different character. But on the other hand, the reaction of the uh, WHO uh, in 2003 and uh, 2020 at the moment, uh, do you think is there any uh, reason or uh, uh, why the situation um, is quite different in 2003 and 2020. Uh, so do you have any ideas or your comment? Yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the SARS and uh, the COVID-19 are different, and the COVID-19 is much more difficult to control. But uh, the WHO actions are quite different as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, WHO is supposed to be a technical agency, and the WHO should provide more technical advice to member states. And uh, during the SARS, WHO the, organized many the professional networks to discuss the various issues. And uh, for the COVID-19, there are, there are some the, such networks, but uh, the, in general, the, these networks are not the active as uh, expected. And uh, the WHO should, the, I believe that the WHO should focus more on the technical issue and uh, the provide the, the technical advice to the member states the, how to the, tackle this uh, the, the very difficult the, the virus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so Professor Kimura, would you give your comments or questions about the presentation of uh, Professor Oshitani? Thank you, Professor Oshitani. Uh, I learned a lot of, uh, about uh, COVID-19. Uh, Professor Oshitani pointed out the differences uh, in the spread of COVID-19 by area or countries. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, it is uh, necessary to carefully discuss why such differences occur. Uh, from various perspectives. Uh, but since uh, I majored in the humanities and social sciences, uh, I can't help but uh, think about the role of cultural behavior uh, behind the differences. And so I'd like to ask uh, Professor Ostani uh, whether it is possible that cultural behaviors are related to the differences. Uh, if so, what specific be, uh, behaviors do you think uh, could have an impact on the differences? As I presented in my presentation, the different countries are using the different approaches for COVID-19. But um, there, there should be many other factors the, involving in the, the, the difference in terms of the impact and the social and the cultural aspect that the should be considered. The, for example, the, some data suggest that the, the social contact patterns are different the, the between Asian countries and uh, European countries or North, North American countries. The, the, social, the social contact pattern in European countries are quite the heterogeneous. There are a lot of social contact the, between the different age groups. But the, in general, the, the social contact pattern in Asia is more homogeneous, and uh, which may the, explain the, the different pattern of spread. And also, 
the, in Japan, the, we, even the, during the start, state of emergency period, the, the, most of the measures were the, implemented on a voluntary basis. The, the, in many countries, the, the, there was uh, some enforcement for the, the stay-at-home type of uh, the measures. But the stay-at-home measures in Japan were the, was a voluntary basis. And uh, closing the shops or the restaurants were also the, the voluntary basis. And uh, which may be, and, uh, and the most of people, the, the follow the, the government advice, and uh, which may be associated with uh, the, the social aspect of the, the, the people in Japan. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, maybe culturally, uh, there may be a possible connection to uh, Confucian uh, tradition in East Asia. Uh, in Confucian, Confucian cultures, uh, the order of the age is uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. So uh, interaction between people of the same age naturally uh, take center stage. And also, uh, from my experience uh, in Japan also, if we look at the social structure of uh, traditional farming or fishing villages, uh, we can see that the age grade system uh, plays an important role, uh, like uh, youth group, uh, middle age groups, and elder groups. Uh, and those groups are dividing up the work uh, that needs to be done in the village. So there are not so many opportunities uh, as we imagine for inter, uh, generational interaction inside the village, Japanese village. Uh, maybe uh, we need to uh, do more research on the topic, but uh, it's very interesting. Mm. It seems very interesting from the viewpoint of law enforcement technique. I think uh, 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 law enforcement with penalty or hard sanction, sometimes not effective uh, in some society. Mm -hmm. So we should recognize what kind of uh, policies or law enforcement could be more uh, applicable or more uh, substantial. So it's uh, probably uh, policy making analysis is necessary as well as a legal analysis uh, or social mm -hmm. uh, analysis, uh, we need a lot of research on, on this point too. Also in Japan, uh, we have a very strong peer pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that's probably <laughs> why the, the many people the follow the, some uh, the, the guidance from the government. The, if it, you go out, the, you have a, the, some the peer pressure the, not to go out. and. Uh, but the, the, this was uh, the one of the reasons why the Japan, Japanese approach was successful the, without penalty. Uh, but uh, this also the, creates some problem, yeah. mm -hmm. the discrimination yes. that may be associated with uh, the peer pressure mm -hmm. and uh, discrimination for the infected the people the, is still the, one of the major issues. The, Yes, we shouldn't uh, admire unilateral Japanese way of things. So it's probably <laughs> there are good good points or bad points. So we should uh, recognize both both aspects. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. Uh, thank you very much, professors, for your discussions from several point of view. So. Uh, as already referred to by the speakers, we have, to, we have two important perspectives which help us to deepen our understanding of the current situation of COVID-19. The first perspective concerns the role of international organizations like WHO, and the second is about the, the importance of the culture or religious background of each country. So we will focus on these two topics. And first, we'd like to address the international perspective. So uh, I'd like to hand over to Professor Ueki to explain and analyze the legal structure and the historical context of the global health governance regime. OK, thank you very much indeed, Professor Dake. Uh, I'd like to talk very briefly about the international regime for global health 
especially historical and legal viewpoints. So next slide, please. Uh, historically speaking, uh, there are a lot of uh, human uh, activity in order to contain the p pandemic. But uh, in, in a kind of modern sense, I, I think a uh, quarantine code in Venice, Venezia in the uh, 14th century is a very famous one. And uh, many uh, people pointed out this is a kind of origin of modern uh, public health countermeasures. And uh, this uh, quarantine code, uh, which uh, enforced the uh, isolation uh, for the 40 years, uh, 40 days, sorry, and the origin of the quarantine uh, measures. And this type of uh, action uh, were introduced many Mediterranean and European countries, but uh, this is our domestic measures adopted by each state or each cities, and not uh, international collaboration. So next slide, please. Uh, as for the international collaboration in order to contain the pandemic is uh, from the 19th century. Uh, in, in the 19th century, uh, especially uh, in the uh, Mediterranean port cities, uh, sanitary council uh, were established. It's uh, composed uh, by the European countries' consulate as, as well as the Ottoman uh, administration of officers. Uh, it's, a, so it's a kind of international uh, organization, international organ, in order to cope with uh, these uh, pandemic issues. So it is a historical origin of modern uh, international collaboration uh, in order to fight uh, against the uh, pandemic. So next slide, please. Uh, this kind of uh, history expanded in, in the uh, 19th century, and there are many international sanitary conferences were held uh, from, from the uh, 19th century to the 20th century, and uh, several international sanitary conventions uh, were adopted uh, in order to contain some uh, infectious diseases. Uh, and also some region, especially in Europe and North America, some international office uh, were established in order to cope with, uh, uh, avoid the pandemic, uh, cross-border pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, the main, main effort in order to make uh, global uh, standards, uh, I could say, uh, started in the League of Nations era. So League of Nations were, was established in uh, 1915, and uh, under the covenant of the League of Nations provided in Article 23 about the uh, uh, control of the diseases. This is uh, one of the objects of the League of Nations clearly mentioned. And according to this uh, covenant uh, in 1922, uh, Health Organization of the League of Nations was established. And uh, this organ made a lot of achievement. For example, the international standardization of some vaccines or some measures uh, to contain uh, some diseases as well as uh, global health. And uh, it, it, it has actually, the, some people talk about the failure of the League of Nations. Of course, in the peace and security areas, uh, it, has, it, ha it made a, a lot of difficulties, but in the field of global health, I think uh, the League of Nations uh, made, uh, to some degree, great uh, achievement. Next slide, please. And uh, according to the United Nations Charter, the uh, UN Charter provided in Article 57 about the definition of specialized agencies. So Article uh, 59 provided the definition of the specialized agencies, which means that they're established by intergovernmental agreement and having wide international responsibilities 
and there is some mentioning some areas, economic, social, culture, educational, and health. So health is clearly mentioned in the UN Charter to cope with by UN. And uh, uh, specialized agencies, uh, next slide please. Of course, the WHO, World Health Organization, is a specialized agency in these areas. And uh, in 1946, uh, World Health Conference was held in Washington, D.C. in the United States, and the Charter of World Health Organization was adopted and entered into force in 1948. So in 1948, the WHO was formally established as the uh, specialized agencies of one of the UN. And it is, uh, I should point out here that the WHO has six regional offices uh, Europe, Americas, Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, and Western Pacific. And these six uh, offices have uh, very strong autonomy. So next slide, please. And what is the uh, uh, rulemaking fun functions of WHO? Uh, as I mentioned in this slide, uh, originally WHO adopted international sanitary regulations, ISR, in 1952. This is a very classical sanitary regulation. So in order to cope with much, much more than regulations, WHO adopted in 1969 international health regulations, IHR 1969. But uh, these uh, regulations are revised several times but uh, this regulation listed uh, some specific in infectious diseases and so on. So uh, Professor Oshitani mentioned the uh, SARS outbreak in, from 2002 to 2003. At that time, this old uh, IHR, IHR 1969, should cope with the uh, situation. But after the this has outbreak in 2005, uh, the new international health, health regulations were, was adopted and IHR 2005. This is the uh, present uh, WHO uh, rules, uh, which uh, I took pictures in the right side. And uh, after uh, this IHR 2005 entered into forces in 2007, so after 2007, WHO coped with this new IHR. Uh, for example, the, in 2009, uh, H1N1 uh, new influenza outbreak, and also a famous case 2014 Ebola outbreak in Africa, uh, the WHO uh, declared the uh, public health emergency of international concern, which uh, Professor Oshitani already mentioned. So at the, at the moment, WHO could declare this situation. And uh, Professor Oshitani uh, introduced uh, COVID-19, the WHO declared this situation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, lastly, I would like to point out that this is very busy, uh, very small. Uh, uh, figure so it, uh, we couldn't uh, see clearly, but uh, there are 17 uh, specialized agencies of UN at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the headquarters of these 17 uh, specialized agencies situated only in Europe or North America. WHO headquarter is situated, of course, in Geneva, in, in Switzerland. And uh, in Switzerland, there are so many headquarters of these specialized agencies. This is a historical reason because some uh, international uh, organizations, specialized agencies, uh, their origins are uh, admin, International Administrative Bureau, which uh, historically origin in the 19th century. So that's my uh, brief comment from the historical and legal point of view. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ueki, for your presentation, which helps us to understand better the history and the legal structure of WHO. So, Professor Oshitani, could you give us your comments or questions about Professor Ueki's presentation? 
I used to work in the WHO regional office uh, in Manila, mm -hmm. the regional office for Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, uh, the, there are six regional offices uh, for WHO, mm -hmm. and headquarters is uh, located in Geneva. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is always the, some issue between the regional offices and the headquarters. And uh, actually, the, the regional directors of uh, the each regional office the, are elected by the, the member state in the region. And uh, this is quite unique the, the, among the other UN organizations. The, do you think uh, that the such structure that affect uh, the operation of the WHO? Yes, uh, thank you very much indeed, Professor Oshitani. Uh, you are right, and uh, you correctly pointed out that the uh, autonomy of regional office of WHO uh, are very strong. And uh, from the governance of WHO as a whole is concerned, probably uh, it makes some difficulties to coordinate globally a uh, global standard uh, in order to each area of the globe. But on the other hand, probably in order to contain each diseases, uh, regional characters or regional situation is quite different uh, on the globe. So I could say it is uh, democratic or it is uh, very practical. But on the other hand, the, from the governance of the specialized agencies concerned, WHO have had some difficulties or some problem in this regard. But probably in this point too, uh, there are some good points and also some disadvantage on this point. This is my personal impression. Thank you very much. Uh, so Professor Kimura, could you give us uh, your comments or questions about the presentation yeah. of the Professor Ueki? Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ueki. Uh, I have a very short question. Uh, during Professor Weki's talk, uh, I was impressed by the story of the Ottoman Empire's incorporation uh, into the International Sanitary Council. Uh, the fact uh, that Ottomans, uh, who are politically and uh, religiously different from uh, the Western world, were uh, uh, participating in this committee uh, was a great surprise to me. Uh, I'd like to ask you whether religious issues, uh, for example, uh, the issue of Islamic pilgrimage, uh, were discussed at the meeting. Uh, because after uh, following this uh, outbreak, Saudi Arabia uh, had stopped accepting pilgrimage uh, this year. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, as far as I know, at least uh, for the first time since the country was founded. So uh, I, I'd like to ask you about that. Okay. okay, thank you very much indeed for your question, Professor Kimura. Uh, Sanitary Council established in the port city in Ottoman empires. Uh, th these councils are very technical council uh, in order to cope with the uh, disease or sanitary issues. So this council could not touch upon very uh, political or very religious or very delicate issues on the sovereignty itself. So I think this council only cope with very technical, uh, how to uh, cope with the quarantine or how to cope with the infected chest disease and so on. But his historically speaking, uh, of course, the history of international law, in modern international law, uh, uh, many part of this modern international law originated in the uh, 19th century Europe or North America. So when we learn about the history of international organization or history of international law, it is very crucial uh, how and when outside Europe countries are uh, integrated or observed in, into the European uh, legal system. That's the history of the uh, international law in modern sense. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting. Ottoman Empire admitted to some degree uh, to cope with uh, European powers in the 19th century. So this is a point where, of course, each state has their own national interest. But on the other hand, in order to contain these uh, infectious diseases, there are some uh, common interests 
uh, among Ottoman and European powers uh, in order to contain these uh, infectious diseases. This is uh, a very crucial point, uh, which at the moment, for example, the, the, the WHO should cope with uh, this crisis. So uh, each state has their own national, national interest or national security policy, but on the other hand, we need a, a common interest in order to fight against the pandemic and so on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I ask yes, one more yes, question? Yes, please. The, the, there is also the big difference between 2003 and mm. the 2020. Yes. In 2003, we had the, the SARS, mm. and the 2020, we are having uh, the COVID-19, mm. the pandemic. And uh, the, the major difference is uh, at the in 2003, the WHO was uh, the key player in the global health. Mm. But uh, now in the global health arena, there are many different players, and uh, such as uh, the, the NPO, NGO, yeah. Yeah. the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation yes, is yes, quite big. Yes, yes. And also there are many other the, the international or the, 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 the also the, the pharmaceutical industries yes. the, is getting more power and more influential yes. in the global health. Yeah. The, do you think uh, this kind of change affect uh, the WHO operation for the COVID-19? Yes, uh, yes de definitely, I think uh, you are correct. Uh, I think in, in, from the classical international law viewpoint, uh, only sovereign state or to some degree public international organizations are the only subjects of international law or they, they, are, they, they are the only actor in the international arena. But at the moment in, in this 21st century, uh, the role of sovereign state and the public international organization, the, uh, these roles are, I could say to some degree, uh, decreasing. Uh, as you pointed out rightly, I think the more NGOs or more multilateral companies or some funding agencies or some private actors or civil society as a whole, probably uh, the role of these new, newly emerging actors has much more greater role compared to the 2003 to, to 2020 at the moment. So this tendency, we shouldn't uh, look over this kind of uh, uh, tendency. So that's a very important point in order to cope with uh, this new, new situation. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for your discussion, which is very interesting. So now we'd like to move on to the second question, the cultural, the religious perspective. Okay. So, Professor, uh, so I'd like to hand over to Professor Kimura to analyze characteristics of Japanese culture or religion when faced with the, the infectious diseases. So, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, how people uh, think about the epidemics in Japanese culture or history. Uh, from the viewpoint of the uh, uh, religious studies. So next, please. Uh, in Japan, uh, people have repeatedly suffered from infectious diseases uh, such as cholera, uh, measles, and smallpox uh, since ancient time. Uh, already uh, Professor uh, Ustani mentioned uh, as for smallpox, epidemics were already recorded in the middle of the 6th century. And people forced to cope with uh, them with uh, limited medical knowledge, uh, in fact, uh, to live with them. Uh, in Japan's uh, polytheistic uh, religious traditions, uh, these epidemics have been seen as a work of the deities. Uh, shrines, uh, Left a photo of the left side is a photo of Yasaka Jinja and Kitano Tenmangu in Kyoto. Uh, they are very famous, and uh, both uh, shrines are related to the epidemics. 
the shrines are often built to comfort those deities uh, when outbreaks uh, of uh, pestilence uh, occurred. Next, please. And one of the most common among such uh, deities uh, is the smallpox uh, deities. Uh, shrines and stone monuments dedicated to the smallpox deities uh, exist throughout Japan. Uh, left side is a photo of the, a small uh, pox deity in Sendai, uh, our city, uh, located on the border of early modern Sendai town. Uh, and you can see the three stones, uh, and uh, still many people uh, go to pray here. Uh, the deity, uh, but uh, sh however, uh, its characteristics uh, of the smallpox deities uh, and identity are extremely uh, diverse uh, and ambiguous. The deity is uh, thought to bring the disease, uh, but at the same time uh, to heal people from it. Uh, and he is, uh, the deity is uh, the savior of the dead, but at the same time, uh, he himself is identified with the dead uh, by smallpox. Uh, many people believe uh, people who suffered and died, uh, killed by uh, smallpox, uh, became uh, these uh, deities. So people did not try to uh, get rid of the deities, uh, but uh, they tried to make him calm down uh, or ask him to return by treating him uh, with hospitality. Uh, next, please. And whenever a patient with smallpox came out, uh, in, uh, in, this is uh, in early uh, modern period, a shelf uh, for the deities uh, of the disease was set up uh, near the patient's bed, uh, like a uh, photo of left above. Uh, and those uh, rice cakes uh, and gohei, uh, this is a paper ornament, uh, were offered uh, to him. Uh, the red color was uh, considered to be a, a favorite uh, of the smallpox deities, and often uh, yeah, something uh, something uh, red uh, was, was placed uh, around the patient. Uh, left, uh, left, uh, photo of left below uh, is a, a famous uh, Akabeko figure uh, of Aizu uh, area, uh, Fukushima Prefecture. And actually, uh, this, uh, this figure uh, was made by my daughter uh, when uh, her school trip. Uh, but, uh, but uh, I asked to her uh, what is the meaning. Uh, she cannot answer uh, this, uh, why this is a red. But originally, uh, this is uh, for, the, uh, for the prevention of the, uh, yeah, for the for dedicated for the uh, smallpox deities. And uh, uh, after the 12 or 13 days, uh, the shelves are taken down uh, and the doors and gohei paper, uh, which have been used as medium uh, for the smallpox deities, uh, are thrown into the river, the sea, or the grounds of the shrine. Uh, next, please. And this is uh, also a very interesting uh, case. Uh, letters uh, named Apology of the Smallpox Deities, written in early modern period, have been found in houses across uh, eastern Japan, uh, thought to have been uh, used as an amulet. Uh, in that letter, uh, the deities uh, who had received generous hospitality uh, regretted uh, that uh, they had spread and weighed the, uh, the disease uh, and promised uh, they never bring severe disease and terrible after effects. Uh, and also uh, in this uh, letter, uh, they advised the sick not to lie until he is fully recovered, uh, to be patient uh, without scratching the itch and to use a, a rabbit's hand uh, if you can't uh, to take uh, if you can't uh, patient, uh, and also uh, to take a bath uh, in the liquor uh, after symptoms are gone, uh, etc. Uh, if we see uh, uh, this kind of the uh, image of deities. Uh, 
people uh, we, we can we can know uh, how people uh, coexist uh, with uh, diseases in early modern era. Uh, I think uh, the important role of culture, especially religious culture, uh, is to show uh, that uh, this world. Uh, where uh, there is a, a variety of suffering and sorrow is still worth living. Uh, under the present circumstances, uh, we have uh, no choice uh, but uh, to choose to live with coronavirus uh, for the time being. Uh, how do we accept this situation and survive uh, without losing uh, the joy of living? Uh, maybe uh, we need to learn uh, from history uh, and culture. And finally, uh, I will mention the issue of the dead as an important point for this purpose. Uh, in the case of the smallpox deities uh, mentioned above, the dead suffered and killed by uh, smallpox uh, could become a smallpox deity and revered widely by people who suffered by the same sickness. Uh, this notion, uh, which uh, was not limited to smallpox, uh, but uh, was found in many other diseases, uh, our concern uh, about uh, this uh, COVID-19 is that in some cases, uh, the people uh, who died from the uh, infectious disease were not sent off with respect in sufficient way. Uh, we hear that if a patient dies in uh, isolation, the next time we can see uh, them is after they are cremated. Uh, humans are mortal beings uh, who will uh, die one day. So uh, the issue of the dignity of the dead is our own problem. Uh, how can we uh, responsibly uh, protect the dignity of such dead person uh, in a, a post-corona society? The case of the smallpox deity uh, poses such a question to us today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kimura, for your presentation, which is very interesting, not only for the international viewers, but also even for the Japanese. So, uh, Professor Oshitani, would you give us your comments and questions about Professor Kimura's presentation? Thank you, Professor Kimura, for a very interesting talk. And uh, I also believe that uh, there should be some cultural or religious aspect uh, to explain the difference between the Asian countries and the Western countries in terms of the, the impact of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, as you mentioned, uh, we have to, the, this virus is quite difficult to control or contain. And uh, containment is uh, the, probably not possible in near future. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Western countries, they try to contain the, this virus and uh, the, in Japan or some Asian countries, they probably accepted this virus and uh, they, they to coexist with this virus. And, uh, but uh, I'm wondering if uh, this kind of uh, the belief is common in uh, the Asian countries or the unique in, uh, in Japan. Uh Okay, thank you very much for your uh, in important question. Uh, I think uh, this kind of belief uh, we can see uh, around, uh, especially in East Asian countries, uh, in China, uh, especially uh, uh, there are some, uh, I know some gods, uh, they are, uh, suffer they are uh, who suffered by uh, the diseases uh, became the god. Uh, the concept, uh, concept like that uh, we can see in East Asian countries. And also, uh, I know some uh, Korean cases. So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, uh, especially uh, East Asian countries have the uh, same ideas of God, mm -hmm. I think. Thank you, Mr. So, Professor Wiki, would you have some questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting presentation. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Kimura. Uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, uh, your daughter didn't know the, what the red color is. For, and uh, I, I'm, every day I drive through the 
国見放送シーンズ、また、I have not noticed that the pandemic、uh, goes or something like that.、Mm. So, I think you, you are true that the Japanese people or Japanese society had a lot of historical experience for the infectious diseases from the very old time to the modern times.、Mm. But、uh, I wonder if there, is there any、mm, this kind of experience rooted in the ordinary Japanese people's attitude or、mm, way of life? Uh, in, in one sense, in Japanese society, it became very modernized or westernized, I could、mm. say. On the other hand, there are something,、uh, we have still have something、uh, original, or I, I, I'm not sure how to explain, but、uh, so this kind of balance、uh, in Japanese society、uh, could or would affect. Our attitude to the COVID 19,、mm. or, not, or to some, what kind of degree、uh, we are in this kind of very rich experience in the very old days.、Mm. But on the other hand, we are very scientific. Scientific research is very important. So some people criticize this kind of thing, superstition, or something like that.、Mm. So the combination of this. Two factors are very difficult、mm. uh, to topic、mm. we should encounter、yeah. the COVID 19.、Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. A very important <coughs> point, I think.、Uh, but uh, maybe uh, your question is uh, connected to uh, the future of the Japanese religion.、Uh, according to my understanding,、uh, Yeah, Japanese religion is not like、uh, Western or monotheistic religion, believe or not, per,、uh, types of、uh, religion, beliefs or not. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe Japanese belief for、uh, religion for Japanese is a、uh, uh, who knows religion, who knows types of religion. Uh, many Japanese people、uh, yeah, know scientific knowledge uh, and uh, medical knowledge. Uh, uh, Japanese people love to go to hospitals. Uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, uh, they go to a hospital every day, but、uh, also they go to、uh, temples or Shinto shrines. Yeah,、uh, maybe we, we ask them, they answer,、uh, yeah, who knows? That, so it is very diff-、uh, different from the monotheistic religion.、Uh, it is impossible in monotheistic tradition.、Uh, who knows、uh, God exists? It,、uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it is not、uh, polite to, to God, maybe、uh, in、uh, monotheistic tradition. So,、uh, yeah, so.、Uh, Uh, according to my understanding,、uh, yeah, that is a feature of Japanese、uh, religion. So Japanese people,、uh, Japanese people know scientific knowledge, but uh, they uh, did some religious activities uh, because uh, they think who knows uh, it uh, affects, uh, yeah, it works.、Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the very interesting and、uh, thought provoking analysis and discussions about the historical and the current situation about infectious diseases. Based on these、uh, analysis of the historical and the current situation, we'd like to move on to the discussion about the future prospects. But before that, I'd like to ask the speakers some questions that we received from the viewers.、Mm. I appreciate all of your questions. So, we wish we could cover all of them, but I'm afraid that we do not have enough time to do so. So, please allow me to ask some of them. So, the first question is、uh, How do some countries advocate, advocate expanded testing, testing PCR test, I guess? Others argue that less testing. Does it depend more on technology or culture? So, Professor Oshitani, could you respond to this question? This is a very difficult question to answer. But,、um, the, in Japan, the, the PCR capacity was 
limited in the, the initial stage of outbreak. There are several reasons for that, but uh, the, we managed to identify most of the severe cases uh, with limited the PCR capacity. And we also managed to identify the, the many clusters the, by using the PCR the capacity more effectively. Mm -hmm. And um, but in the Western countries or some other countries, the, they try to the contain this virus mm -hmm. by expanding the, the testing mm -hmm. capacity. But uh, testing, 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 the, they may not work for this virus. Mm -hmm. the, this virus the, has very the, the difficult characteristic. Mm -hmm. The, the, this is a very invisible the, the disease. It's very difficult to detect the all cases, mm -hmm. including uh, the very mild or the even asymptomatic mm -hmm. cases. So the testing alone cannot solve the problem, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to find the alternative the strategy. The for Japan, mm -hmm. the, that was uh, the, the cluster-based mm -hmm. approach, mm -hmm. and some other countries are using the different approaches. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, this question concerns the cultural <laughs> perspective. So, Professor Kimura, I'd like to ask you if the culture of, culture of each country might be affecting its strategy of PCR test. Uh, yeah. Uh, to answer this question is a great challenge for me. <laughs> it's challenging. Uh, maybe uh, less testing is a matter of uh, systems or strategies. And I don't believe that uh, culture is uh, directly involved in uh, that, that uh, problem. But uh, culture may play a role uh, in uh, why people are able to accept such a strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, there could have been mass protests uh, among the public against such a strategy, but uh, this uh, did not happen. Uh, but it, uh, it, uh, but it may have something to do with the Japanese attitude to, uh, towards uh, politics and their view uh, of life and death. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, it is uh, dangerous uh, to uh, essentialize uh, culture uh, in this way. But I guess uh, if uh, this had happened during the time when the student movement is popular in 1960s or 70s, uh, the reaction of the society would be uh, totally different. Mm. I think uh, maybe uh, this is another thing uh, we can learn from the history. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would like to move on to the next question. Okay. The second question is what implications for the low and middle income countries? So, Professor Oshitani, would you, uh, could you respond to this question? The, as I mentioned, the different countries are using the different approaches. The, this is a new virus and uh, previously unknown virus. And uh, we do not have uh, the, the one size fits all type mm -hmm. of uh, the approach for this virus. And each country has a different uh, the capacity, mm -hmm. and each country is in a different uh, situation uh, in terms of the, the epidemiological situation of the outbreak. So the, every country should uh, develop the, their own the approach or the strategy. And uh, it's, it's quite important to the share the experiences mm -hmm. between the countries. The, the probably the, in other, other countries, uh, Japanese approach may not be applicable, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, from uh, our experience, the other country can learn some lessons. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the, the exchange of uh, the lessons learned mm -hmm. or the good, good practices mm -hmm. are quite important. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the, between the low or middle income countries, mm -hmm. the, they should the, the learn each other. Mm -hmm. And that's probably an important process. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor Ueki, could you yes. <laughs> make a comment? Yes. The so, uh, impact of COVID-19 to low and uh, middle income countries are very uh, large uh, in, in the sense that uh, not only for the public health or medical care, but also it, it, it might destroy some kind of infrastructure of the society. So in, in that regard, I think uh, today we discussed about the WHO 
only. But of course, WHO is a specialized agency so for public health and medicine and so on. But as for the, uh, in order to respond to the impact of COVID-19, we should collaborate, uh, not only WHO, but also other uh, international organizations as well as uh, funding agencies and so on. So it's our infrastructure of the society is very important to cope with the uh, pandemic of COVID-19. So collaboration, for example, the World Bank or uh, World Bank organizations, families, or WHO, not only WHO, but other specialized agencies and funding agencies, or each government uh, assistance organization, they, they should coordinate the, to support the build the strong infrastructure against COVID-19, especially for the uh, low and middle income countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have more questions, but uh, we are running out of time. So uh, I'd like to move on to the discussion of the future prospects. So according to the analysis of the historical and current situation that we have discussed so far, we have two questions. The first question is how global society should move on in, uh, in order to achieve the international population during the, and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And the second one is uh, what is the significance, which is uh, already mentioned, but what is the significance of learning from history and, the con well, and the culture for the human society faced with the infectious disease? So first we will address the first question. And I'd like to ask Professor Eck first uh, how global health governance regime should be or which actor, which player, uh, public or private, should play what role in realizing the international collaboration against uh, infectious diseases? Yes, uh, I have already answered to the mm -hmm. question from mm -hmm. Professor Oshitani. Mm -hmm. uh, probably yeah, WHO has some difficulties or some questions in one sense, uh, but I could say the politicization of specialized agencies is not only to WHO, but also other international organizations. They have some difficulties. They have some problems, but uh, probably we could uh, make some uh, proposals or some uh, revisions of uh, future plan and so on. But probably uh, it is, for my opinion, the most important thing is uh, uh, we should reconsider the uh, common, uh, common interest or common purpose of the fight against uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, it is natural for each government or each state has its own national interest or na national security. It's okay. But on the other hand, it is true, but on the other side of the truth, uh, in order to cope with this pandemic is a common interest, not only one state, but also all the globe. So we should be uh, reconsider this kind of international uh, common interest so to fight with our pandemic issues. And uh, in that sense, we should, we should not be too pessimistic uh, to the governance regime about the public health issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So perhaps, Professor Ohishitani, would you give us a comment? Yes, uh, the, I actually have a question to the Professor Weiki. The, I, I agree that uh, the infectious disease the, can be a common interest for the all countries of concern, but um, the, the, the compared to other issues like a trade and other, but uh, the currently there is uh, the big tension the, between WHO and uh, some countries and also the, the between countries. And uh, it seems that uh, the, the collaboration between countries and uh, the collaboration, the organ, the coordinated by WHO, the, are not the functioning as expected. And uh, the, we are the facing to this uh, the big challenge without uh, the coordinating body right now. The, how we can deal with uh, this uh, the pandemic without the coordinating body? 
Yes,、uh, that's a very crucial <laughs> question at the moment in the global <laughs> society. But uh, uh, in some specialized agencies, for example, UNESCO or、uh, global regime of the law of the sea, the United <coughs> Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, some、uh, big countries are not parties. So, but in that In, in that regard, probably we could manage somehow because,、uh, as、uh, Professor Oshitani rightly mentioned, the role of the sovereign state or the public international organization, of course, at the moment, th they should be the critical role in order to coordinate our effort to fight against、uh, COVID 19. But on the other hand, other actors in the global arena. Is becoming much more stronger compared with the 20th century. So, if we could coordinate the specialists of the public health or medicine or uh, some uh, big companies and so on, probably we could、uh, somehow find a way to manage the global regime to fight against、uh, COVID 19. So, I would like to tend to believe、uh, the future in, the, in that way. Thank you. Thank you. So, perhaps, Professor Kimura, could you give us your comments or questions? Yeah, I have a short comment from the Asia Studies viewpoint.、Uh, this, uh, this pandemic is uh, important uh, not only for cooperation between、uh, countries, but also for the issue of inter religious cooperation. Uh, maybe uh, you, uh, Professor、uh, Ueki, mentioned about uh, uh, new actors in the global arena. Maybe、uh, the religious groups uh, also uh, included uh, them. Uh, in many regions, the religious prayer meeting is、uh, of essential doctrinal importance. Gathering together to pray to God and strengthen each other's faith、uh, is a very important thing for religious groups. Uh, in many parts of the world,、uh, there are known cases of clusters of, clusters of meetings by religious groups、uh, that have spread the disease.、Uh, there have been cases where religious gatherings have been forced to、uh, comply with governmental requests、uh, for restraint and bans.、Uh, on the other hand, however,、uh, In not a few religious uh, denominations, uh, we can see the movement to refrain from religious meetings voluntarily、uh, because of the public interest of、uh, combating infectious diseases.、Uh, in Japan, the Catholic、uh, Diocese of Tokyo and the Protestant Church of Christ in、uh, Japan、uh, suspended meetings in church and also、uh, concerning about the Islam.、Uh, Indonesia's Ulama Council、uh, made a statement that during the month of Ramadan,、um, Muslims should pray at home, not、uh, at mosques. So uh, maybe uh, this could be the opportunity、uh, religion have turned their attention to the common good、uh, of the world. And refrain from gathering in spite of its doctrine and tradition.、Uh, in religious studies、uh, for the last decades or so, such issues have been discussed under the concept of、uh, religion and public or public religion.、Uh, rather than making a religion、uh, a group that serves a particular enclosed group of followers,、uh, the concept urged、uh, religions to be、uh, responsible for the happiness of more open human society as a whole. Uh, it may be a, a bit uh, optimistic, uh, but、uh, through this infection, many regions、uh, have turned their attention to the common good and the、um, public.、Uh, maybe uh, this is the、uh, answer to the question we accepted beforehand、uh, from participants、uh, What is new、uh, concerning religious party movements during and after the COVID、uh, 19 pandemic? I think. Thank you. Also, do you have any comments? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so uh, we have already talked about the religious or cultural perspective. So,、uh, but the, we would like to move on to the next、uh, question. What is the significance of learning from history and culture for society, which is 
already mentioned by the professors, but uh, I'd like to ask uh, once again, uh, we, what is the significance of the learning from history and cu the culture for our human society? So I'd like to inquire of Professor Kimura. Kimura. Uh, uh, first, uh, the, the importance of the learning from history. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, the significance of culture and history uh, can be divided into two main uh, categories. Uh, the first uh, is that we uh, learn uh, from the facts of the past. Uh, by looking back at past cases of the spread of uh, infectious diseases, uh, we can predict uh, what will happen in the future. Uh, and some lessons and new ideas could be drawn uh, from it. Uh, on the other hand, the significance of studying culture and history uh, does not stop at the level of such facts. Uh, since uh, the Great East Japan earthquake, uh, Mike Krieg and me uh, have been thinking about the significance of intangible cultural heritage, uh, cultural assets, uh, such as festivals and folk arts, uh, and found such cultural assets uh, have become an integral part of the uh, lives of people living in the affected areas. Uh, at first glance, uh, it may seem uh, that uh, these events do not help uh, in the recovery and mitigation of the disasters in affected areas. However, uh, many survivors have found emotional support in such events. Uh, and I've been seeing uh, uh, through these activities, the community is uh, revitalized. Uh, learning about history and culture uh, is a great way to learn about how our ancestors were able to live in the midst of uh, difficult circumstances uh, and still not lose the joy of living uh, in it. Uh, even if a post-corona world could control the coronavirus uh, using the most uh, advanced uh, science and technology, uh, maybe uh, if we to uh, forced to live in a dystopia of a surveillance society, uh, it makes no sense. Uh, we need to build a society in which it be in each individual feels uh, that this world is worth living, uh, it, no matter how uh, much pain uh, he or she may experience. Uh, I believe uh, running from history and culture is one of the effective ways to achieve it. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Osei, do you have any comments? Yes, uh, the, I also believe that uh, it's important to learn lessons from the, the, the history. And uh, the, the, I'm reading some books uh, about uh, the infectious disease in the past. And uh, there are probably many the, the lessons the, that we should learn from the history. And uh, the, the human beings, the have been the fighting against the infectious disease the, in the whole the human being history. And um, the, the, in, behind the many cultural beliefs, the, there might be some secret the, to uh, avoid certain the, the risk uh, of infectious diseases. But uh, especially in the Western culture, the, they probably the, could not, they have probably lost their, the, such the cultural belief. And uh, that's the, maybe the reason why the, they are having more the severe the, the, the impact the, by COVID-19. We need to the, look at the, the such aspect. And uh, the, there are many the different questions the, the regarding COVID-19, and uh, especially the difference between the countries. And uh, we need to look at it from the different perspectives. And uh, we need to the, the work with uh, the different the, the, the people, and, uh, like uh, Professor Kimura. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is very important. Uh, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Ueki, do yes, you have yes. any comments? Yes, uh, yes this uh, pandemic uh, rem reminds us uh, history of, uh, for example, the Nara's big Buddha was built uh, because of the uh, widespread uh, pandemic at that time. The emperor ordered mm -hmm. the built a big uh, Buddha. Mm -hmm. But 
in, in ordinary life, uh, our Japanese people might uh, not consider this kind of history. But uh, now we consider a lot of history, or not only in Japan, we learned a lot from the many part of the globe, uh, foreign countries on the other part of uh, areas. So, so human beings have, 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 been, have been fighting or coexisting uh, the such kind of pandemic. So it is very important. Of course, the scientific research for, to fight or, uh, against the pandemic is very important. This is essential part of our future effort. On the other hand, we, we uh, reconsider uh, or we think again our, our history comparison to the other culture or other area of the globe. So this makes us much more rich response to this uh, crisis or pandemic issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting discussions. So, as, so as at, the, at the end of this uh, dialogue, as a summary of today's discussion, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask each professor to give us a message about the future growth of the global collaboration or culture or history, and also the future growth of the universities, especially the, those of Tokyo University <laughs> in this global struggle against the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Professor Oshitani, first, please. Yes, um, there are many things uh, the, that we should uh, learn from this uh, the pandemic. And uh, the first thing is uh, the, this, the COVID-19 pandemic that showed that uh, the, our the society the, in the globalization era is very vulnerable mm -hmm. to the, the, this kind of risk. And uh, the, we are probably uh, going to face many more threats in the future. Mm -hmm. So we have to the, the build more resilient society and uh, the, the globalization is uh, the, probably the, one of the reasons why the, 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 the virus spread so mm -hmm. rapidly mm -hmm. and the globalization is associated with uh, the speed of the spread of this virus mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the now the, we have to balance between the social and economic impact and uh, the the, the impact of the, the COVID-19. So the, the medical or the public health, the, the expert cannot decide everything. Mm -hmm. We have to collaborate with uh, the many different, the, 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 the people with many different expertise. And uh, the Tohoku University the also the should have some role mm -hmm. the, in co conducting such the interdisciplinary the collaboration mm -hmm. and um, so that's a key to the build more the resilient mm -hmm. society, and uh, not just for the COVID-19, but uh, to build the the, the new society, mm -hmm. the, the even after the, the COVID-19, mm -hmm. and uh, the, our university uh, should have some role mm -hmm. in building such society. Thank you very much, and so next, Professor Waki. Yes, uh, so Professor Oshitani rightly pointed out that the uh, Tohoku University suffered the Great uh, East Japan earthquake in 2011, and after that we launched uh, many uh, multidisciplinary uh, projects uh, in order to reconstruct of the, uh, our region or Japan as a whole. And uh, for example, the uh, International Research Institute for Disaster Science was established after the uh, 1911, uh, 2011, just after the earthquake in 2012, that, that institute was established. In that institute was very multidisciplinary institute in order to cope with disaster. And this institute was uh, very uh, Sub substantial role in order to cope with this COVID-19 crisis because we need a lot of collaboration of the research in many fields, 
uh, not only medical research, public health research, uh, uh, pharmaceutical research, and uh, uh, historical research or the legal research and so on. So that's the reason why the Tohoku University could prepare uh, this uh, COVID-19 crisis much uh, easier or much rapid uh, than the other universities in Japan, I think. So it is very essential in order to cope with this COVID-19 crisis, the multi disciplinary or the uh, interdisciplinary research because the impact of the COVID-19 is quite large, not only in medical care or the disease issues, but also social structure as a whole should cope with this crisis. So there are not only the medical researcher, but also uh, engineer researcher or science researcher, as well as uh, uh, humanities researcher or social scientist could uh, collaborate in order to cope with this as a whole, as a one team. So in that sense, Tohoku University has a great uh, faculties and uh, Professor Oshitani is reading the advice, good, very efficient advice to the government, and uh, not only to the government, but local government as well, and the university uh, management of the COVID-19. So we are very uh, capable of this crisis and build a much more stronger uh, society uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So Professor Kimura, <laughs> uh, Through this uh, dialogue with uh, Professor Ustani and Professor Weki, yeah, I uh, believe uh, it is very important uh, to make uh, our, our society uh, a place where people can feel uh, that the world is worth living in. Uh, so. Uh, in order to achieve this goal, uh, it is necessary for researchers from uh, various academic fields uh, to work together uh, across uh, academic boundaries uh, to promote uh, research. Uh, a uni maybe a university like uh, Tohoku University uh, can be a platform uh, for such research. Uh, so yeah, I believe uh, this dialogue is a good example of such a platform, and I hope uh, that uh, more and more opportunities uh, like this will come up uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, professors. I really appreciate each professor's contribution to today's online dialogue and uh, your very interesting discussions. So we are very happy if you, uh, if you enjoyed today's dialogue. And the uh, Talk Forum for Creativity is conducting a questionnaire about uh, today's event. You can find a URL link uh, in the description box of the YouTube. So please answer the questionnaire from the URL link. Tokyo University will continue working uh, for, toward achieving a new normal. So we would appreciate your uh, interest in our activities. So thank you very much for joining us today.